Well, we have a very special presentation today. Uh, the, the part that I like the most is I'm not going to make it. Chris Patterson's going to make it today because this story, this this explanation of what I think is one of the most clever portfolios and strategies that I know in this industry for for just a ton of the investors who uh, do not want to do a lot of work, but they want to get a good return. And the topic is two funds for life. Now, just just a bit about Chris, just because you may not you may not know his background. Uh, he joined our foundation in 2016, and by 2017, he was having a huge uh, impact on our organization, and continues to as he developed this idea of two funds for life. And also developed the best in class ETF recommendations that so many of you uh, are using, from at least from what you tell me. And so I know that between the two funds for life and that best in class list, that uh, a lot of folks appreciate uh, your work, Chris. I think it might be of interest to uh, some of those people. Uh, that uh, like your work, um, but could you just take a couple of minutes and what happened before uh, you retired and went to work uh, for the Merriman Foundation? So a couple of minutes for uh, 60 years or <laughs> something close to that. Uh, you know, I was really lucky. I was born into a family that talked about investing in finance as a kid. My my grandfather uh, taught me about finance and investing. And so, you know, we're all the product of our history and, and luck plays a huge role in where we end up. That meant that I knew something about taking prudent risks and investing in the stock market as a kid. I knew something about waiting out downturns as as a kid, but I didn't really invest in becoming an educated investor until later in life. I, I had the good fortune, though, when I first went to college of living with my grandmother, and she had to learn how to become an investor later in life because mm -hmm. she was widowed in her 60s. And up until that point, had no involvement in the money matters of the family. And so she had to learn about stocks and, and bonds and, and prudent risk and how to invest. And as I lived with her the first summer I went to college, she would sit around the dinner table and talk to me about diversification and diversification and, you know, letting your winners run. And uh, she watched Louis Rukeyser and uh, she read all these financial journals. And so I learned a lot of things from my grandmother that summer. I learned you can learn late in life. I learned that there is value in being an educated investor, that you should invest in things you understand. And it, it wasn't really until I... Uh, Towards the end of my career, I worked in high tech and product management and just had a, a blessed career. I was really fortunate. I got to work on a lot of fascinating projects. And I chose many times in my career, rather than to try and climb the corporate ladder by staying in the same place, to move to something interesting and just learn again. And uh, I, I have zero regrets about that. It made for a fascinating set of opportunities. But as I got into my late 50s and realized retirement was maybe not as far away as I thought it would be because you just never know when your technical skills aren't going to fit that next job you want. I decided to really double down and start studying. And so I, I read a lot of uh, books on investing. I read a lot of articles. I started listening to a lot of podcasts. Paul, yours was one of them. And being an engineer, who wants to dig into the data and understand why things are what they are, your website and the work of Daryl and, and the foundation really appealed to me. And then, you know, I called you up and the rest is history. Yeah. You, you were kind enough to call me back. Actually, I emailed you, gave you my phone number and you called me back, which uh, is kind of a, a, a very nice thing for you to have done. 
Well, it changed my life. It changed Daryl's life. It changed it's mine. The life yeah. of a lot of investors. So I'm I'm glad you emailed and boy, am I glad I called. Well, so so with that background, uh, we are all ears and eyes here. Daryl and I, uh, Daryl Balls is with us, our director of analytics. And uh, this is a set of tables uh, that that uh, Chris will share today that Daryl didn't put together, but he, he takes credit for a lot of them. But we're going to wait around. We're going to make some notes. We hope not to interrupt uh, during your presentation, but uh, um, I, I guess if it's really important, we might, but don't expect it. But at the end, we want to weigh in and ask some questions that uh, that we know we've gotten from people uh, over the years, whether it's friends or or people following our work. So, Chris, uh, take it away. It's it, it's all yours, and thank you so much for having developed this and taking the time uh, very patiently to explain it. I really, I do personally enjoy your presentations, and I know that that our folks will as well. Well, it's a pleasure to be able to share. And just knowing our audience, I know that they want a lot of the detail, but also knowing that our audience may have friends who don't want the detail, I'm going to give you the really, really pithy two fund for life summary up front. And that's that if you invest in a target date fund, 9% of your or 90% of what you're saving towards retirement, and then you take 10% of what you're saving towards retirement and you put it in small cap value, that decision can increase the amount you have in retirement over just investing in a target date fund by about 25%. Historically, that's about what it's done. And it can do it without a lot of additional risk. And so if if somebody came to me and said, you know, what's the simplest investing strategy you would recommend to someone, that would be it. Put 90% of your retirement savings in a target date fund and 10% in small cap value and let it ride. Now, there's a lot of questions that can go along with that and a lot of variations like what's a target date fund. So we'll cover that in the next 20 to 30 minutes. So what are we going to cover today? I'm going to start with what we just described, basically, Paul. Uh, Yumi and Daryl described the sound investing portfolios and how to apply them. And I want to start there as a reference. So we'll talk about how you would use all of the work that we've just gone through in the previous six to 10 podcasts. Then I'm going to talk about the benefits of a target date fund, one fund that manages risks and can double your lifetime spend pretty much automatically. Then we'll talk about two funds for life and how it can improve things, some options and pros and cons, and then we'll finish out. So sound investing per portfolios used in a do-it-yourself investing strategy, What what's involved? What if somebody said, I really like your ultimate buy and hold portfolio, now I want to use it, what would they have to do? Well, first of all, they have to pick out of these portfolios we've described, which one they think has the best risk return profile. And we've given them a number of what I'll call balanced strategies. These were the worldwide ultimate buy and hold, the uh, US four fund, worldwide four fund, and US two fund. Those are all kind of balanced, half in large, half in small, half in value, half in blend. Then we've given them the worldwide all value and US all value that are tilted a little more towards value and the worldwide small value and US all small cap value. So you'd have to pick one of those. Then you'd have to pick a ratio of US and international because we give you the choice of 50-50, 70-30. Then you use the fine tuning tables to figure out how much fixed income versus equity you want. And then you invest regularly and rebalance annually across that set of investments. And when you get to retirement, you pick a, a withdrawal strategy, whether that's fixed or variable, and you pick a withdrawal rate. And then you take withdrawals annually and you rebalance annually. And this process, when you met with Jack Bogle, Paul, I think he said something to the effect of you can't do that to people, right? Something like have, that, or are you nuts? <laughs> or are you nuts? Yeah. <laughs> now, I know we have, in, we have people that follow our work who do this. 
and they do it diligently and it fits exactly what they want. And I, I, I'm impressed. I, I think that's wonderful. And kudos and props to them. There are people in the world for whom this is exactly the right solution. And, and I think that's great. But there are a lot of people in the world who not only won't they listen to our podcast, but they certainly won't, re, re, inve, uh, won't rebalance annually uh, and they won't do all of the steps on this page. And so I think the work of Two Funds for Life was trying to come up with something that bridges the gap, that helps uh, to address that need for a simpler solution. Jack Bogle's pithy advice, and I, I love to repeat this, and I'm not sure he said all six of these words together in, on any one day, but he did say these two word phrases a number of times throughout his teaching career. Buy right, hold tight, don't peek. And I think that is a recipe for success for a buy and hold investor. But the trick is, what do you buy? That, that's really where this whole thing hinges. Because if you, if you do buy right, then holding tight and not peaking is a good answer. But if you don't buy right, holding tight and not peaking is actually a recipe for disaster. And so a lot of this really comes down to well, what should you buy, you know, to buy right. Now, if you're going to hold tight and you're not going to peak, that means you're not going to rebalance. It means that you're going to um, be doing a smaller number of things as a DIY investor. So what could you buy that would manage risk through a lifetime? And I think the answer is a target retirement fund or a target date fund. Vanguard calls their target date funds, target retirement funds. And they're a good example of what a target date fund is because they're widely available. Um, they're also a good example because um, they, they represent a, I'll call it a moderate or average kind of implementation that's very low cost. And so I, I think they're prudent and they're this glide path, which is the allocation to these different asset classes over time versus age. That's what's over on the right. This is the glide path, um, is the one that we use in modeling and back testing to fund for life strategies or target date fund strategies. So the way it works, and, and a huge number of investors use these, is that when you're enrolled in your retirement, uh, your, your 401k, if you're good, if you're fortunate enough to have one, um, you will probably be defaulted into an investment plan where the year of the target retirement fund or the target date fund is approximately when you turn 65 years of age, approximately the time when you'd be expected to retire. So if you were a college graduate today at 2023 and you expected and, and your age is about 25 years old, so you expect to retire in about 40 years, that means about 2063 you'd probably get enrolled in this 2065 plan right here. And the reason this thing follows the glide path over on the right-hand side, and by the way, the important part of this is this line right here in the middle that I'm kind of highlighting, because that's the line between equities in the bottom or stocks and bonds in the top, is that as you get older, people tend to want to take less, less risk and have less capacity for risk. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But by ramping the number, the percent in equities down as you approach retirement, that reduces the uncertainty in the size of the portfolio. It reduces the volatility of the portfolio. And they actually continue ramping that down past retirement. Retirement is this target date here. Um, because those early years of retirement are also sometimes years of anxiety and stress. So let's dive in just a little bit deeper to, well, why, why does this glide path thing make sense? Um, why would that be a prudent thing for the average investor to do? And over here, I have the industry average target date fund glide path. And you can see that that line between equities and bonds is right, you know, right here through the middle again. And the reason this line follows the shape that it does 
is that our human capital tends to follow a line that is similar, starting out high and ending up low. Well, what do I mean by human capital? Human capital is our ability to earn money by working and invest to grow that money over time through compounding. And with every year that passes, we lose capacity to work. We lose capacity for uh, our investments to work for us. Another way to think of this is if you lost your full net worth at the age of 25, that probably wouldn't be a very big disaster. But if you lost your, your whole net worth at the age of 65, that would be a big disaster because you, you're you not going to have as many years to work to build your nest egg back up. A lot of us just won't be able to work into our 70s or our 80s. Um, and compounding is just not going to be able to do much for us. So that's why the glide path looks the way that it does. And you might ask, well, does this work? Does it, does it actually work for investors? Um, before we go there, though, let's just talk about how many people use these. So Vanguard every year does something called How America Saves. It's a survey of people who uh, use these defined contribution plans through work, uh, things like 401ks. And what they find is that 95% of plans offered target date funds in 2021, and 81% of all participants in those plans used target date funds, and 69% of the participants who owned target date funds had their entire account invested in a single target date fund. So these are really, really important, and it's important for us to figure out whether they work and whether they're prudent. There's something else in the America Saves report, though, that I didn't put on this slide because it's not quoted. Uh, it's not called out as a quote, but the larger the balance of the account, the older the person using the account, the more likely it is they have added a fund to it. So investors, although 69% of all investors using target date funds just have their money in that single target date fund, um, there are a number of investors who add a second fund, a fairly large number. So that's why this two fund for life strategy is going to be important because we want to figure out, well, what would be the best fund to add and why? So do they work in terms of return? If you had invested 10% of your say of your income across your working years, and I'm going to assume 40 working years here in a target date fund, historically, the inflation adjusted value of the, the total that you get to spend in retirement, assuming 30 years of retirement with 4% fixed withdrawals, and the legacy that you left behind is greater than the total money that you accumulated during your working years. So if you think about that, you have two options. You could spend all the money in your working years. And let's just for sake of argument, say you made $100,000 a year for 40 years, you could spend $4 million. Or you could put 10% into a target date fund and the inflation adjusted amount that you got out of the target date fund in your retirement years plus the legacy was worth $4.4 .4 million. So now you got to spend 3.6 during your working years plus 4.4 .4 in your retirement plus legacy, that's $8 million. You have doubled your inflation adjusted lifetime spend. Not bad for taking 10 cents out of every, every dollar and setting it aside into something that's automatic, automatically managed for you. So what is that in pain and dollars using that same set of assumptions? Well, not surprisingly, you have to endure some volatility. You, your worst drawdown for this strategy using the data from 1970 to 2020 was 42% and it happened around mid-career. So it happens around the age of 40 and um, you had to stay, stay with it. You couldn't trade out of the target date fund. You couldn't be panic, panic selling. You had to stick with it. Now, the good news is even through the pandemic recently, only a very small number of retirees using a target date fund did any trading. So there's some indication that people saving for retirement trust these investments and stick with them. So that's good. 
The median nominal withdrawals and end balance actually totaled $50 million. So now you can see why I want to use inflation adjusted numbers, because it's hard to even imagine like $50 million is so big, you are oversaving. Why wouldn't you just save 1%, right? But across 70 years of a life, there's a lot of inflation. And so I, I think it's kind of silly to look at scenarios that are that long in terms of their nominal or non-inflation adjusted dollars. But the inflation adjusted real, that was $4.4 million of return you got for your investment. And you got to spend half of it during retirement and you got to pass half of it on to heirs. Not bad for just one fund, automatic. So do target date funds do what they say they do in terms of managing risk? Well, if we look at a lump sum investor, somebody who puts all of their money in on the first day that they start work, the answer is yes. If you look, this is the drawdowns experienced over time, historically, for a target date fund allocation. And we use that Vanguard-like allocation that we saw earlier. And what you see is that in the very early days, it takes a little while for the worst drawdowns to accumulate. But then you had this potential of a 45% drawdown that you were exposed to for about the only 15 years because it's age 25 to 40. Then for the rest of the time approaching retirement, the worst case drawdown you could have been exposed to declined. And you'll notice that the vast majority of the time you're using a target date fund you're not gonna see this worst case drawdown. Worst case means kind of like once, once in you, it is by definition, unless you have two identical ones or multiple identical ones, almost always it's just a single occurrence. You're just gonna see it once in your investing experience. So with a lump sum investment, seems like it works. But if I was to ask our audience, how many of you started with a lump sum? The answer is practically no one. I mean, some of us started with a little bit of a gift from family or something. But in general, most of us start out with practically zero. So if we start out with zero and we rerun this scenario, what do you see? Well, what you see is that the young investor is protected by the contributions, the regular large contributions that they're making. And that's that's what you see here is that for the first 10 years of an investor's experience, they're not exposed to the full worst case drawdown experience. And yes, this is because they're contributing money, but it, it smooths the ride. It makes it so they're not really exposed to the full volatility of the market. And that kind of suggests that a young investor could take more risk. They've got a lot of years ahead of them. And if you remember back to the glide path for the target date fund, it has 10% bonds in those early years. So what could we do to add meaningful diversification to this target date fund? There are three things that we might want to do if we want to try and improve on the target date fund. We'd like to add meaningful diversification. And by that, what I mean is exposure to these parts of the market that we just talked about over several podcasts that we know have higher expected returns and go up and down at a little bit different time than the total market, which is what is inside the target date fund. So we'd like to add some small and some value maybe. And small and value, some people would say it's already in there. You know, you've You've got the total market in the target date fund, total US market, total international market, don't you have small in value? Well, the only way you get the premium for a small in value is by having a disproportionately large amount of it. You have to have more than the percentage that exists in the total market, because when you own the total market, the small is offset by the large and the, the, uh, the value is offset by the growth. So, Meaningful diversification, if we added some small in value, that could potentially give us a higher return per unit of risk. And that's the second thing. It may improve our returns. Historically, it has. And then the final thing is resilience. By being diversified, the um, safe withdrawal rates, for example, in retirement could improve and historically have improved. So let's look at the very simplest way to do this. And I already 
suggested it earlier, and we'll call it the easy to fund for life strategy. So we'll take somebody who's willing to save 10% and we'll have them save 9% in the target date fund and 1% in U.S. small cap value. And because we know that investors may not want the complexity of having to rebalance annually, or they may not even be able to access small cap value in the 401k, we'll say no rebalancing. And when it comes to retirement, we won't burden the investor with rebalancing. We'll just tell them when you take your withdrawal, use what I call nudge rebalancing and take it from the the outsized asset class. So what do I mean by that? Well, our target here is 90% in the target date fund and 10% in small cap value. So if you look at your portfolio and the target date fund is 91% and your annual withdrawal is 4%, you're going to take the full 4% from the 91%. Or conversely, if small cap value in your portfolio is at 11% or 12 or 13 or whatever, you would take the 4% withdrawal, the full 4% from small cap value. And uh, we'll see we'll see how that did. Now, before I move to the result, I just want to remind you that even though the investor isn't doing anything, there's a lot being done for the investor. The asset classes that are inside the target date fund are being rebalanced periodically. So even though the investor isn't doing much, there's a lot that's being done. The target date fund is also ramping down the risk approaching retirement. It's not just sitting there. It's doing something for you. So although the investor doesn't do a lot, there is a lot happening under the hood and a lot being done for the investor. And if you think about the cost of that, the Vanguard target retirement funds charge 0.08%. So eight basis points, eight one hundredths of 1% per year for all of that work. That's not too bad, not too bad. So what does this do for you? Earlier, we looked at the target date fund and it had a 42% drawdown and $4.4 million real inflation adjusted benefit that came from that. Well, this easy two funds for life has a 44% worst case drawdown. So it's 2% worse, but it has an additional $1.2 million in benefit. So you ended up being able to take out $2.4 million real in retirement. You can think of that as a 10% raise in your retirement check because you went from 2.2 to 2.4. And you ended up with a legacy of $3.2 million. So yeah, the legacy went up more, which might actually suggest that you want to take out instead of 4%, 5% or 4.5% or use one of the variable strategies we talked about earlier in the the flexible distribution tables. So you have options there, but just using the same simple assumptions, you got an extra 25% of total return for a very slight increase in the risk. There is... An issue with this approach, though, it's it's a subtle issue, and that's that because you're not rebalancing an accumulation, as you approach retirement, that small cap value could be getting to be a larger part of your portfolio than the 10% you've allocated to it. And that could increase the risk as you're approaching retirement in a way that is uncomfortable to you. And so with that in mind, we created a second approach that I call the moderate to fund for life strategy. And in this one, what we do is we try to pull more of the risk into the early years by using a multiplier. We do 1.5 times the years to retirement as a percentage. So for example, if you're 20 years from retirement, 1.5 times 20 is 30%. And you would put that, that result into small cap value and you'd put the rest in the target date fund. Now, by the time you get to zero years to retirement, you're putting nothing in small cap value using this strategy. And in this approach, we do ask that you do annual rebalancing during accumulation because you're trying to manage the risk and keep it ramping down as you approach retirement. So how did how did the moderate approach did? Well, it 
it, historically, it delivered about that same 25% boost. But interestingly, the money is more evenly spread between what you take out in retirement and what you leave in legacy. It did have greater risk. Um, the total worst case drawdown here is 47%. So it's uh, 5% worse than the target date fund. But it happens early in your career and there's the, the risk that you feel, the drawdown risk you feel at retirement is the same that you would have felt with a pure target date fund approach. So you know, this may appeal to some people uh, because of that. I know though, from historically having this conversation with people that whenever you offer people a way to do better, they wonder what would happen if I did way better what would happen if I dialed it to 11? <laughs> so let's do the spinal tap version. <clears throat> so we did create an aggressive two fund for life strategy that combines both the idea of carrying this base of small cap value all the way into retirement. And we actually carry a base of 20% all the way across. And we even turned up the ramp so that you ramp more aggressively over time. And in this case, what we do is we look at a ramp that is 2.5 times the years to retirement plus 20%. And we put that in small cap value and the rest in the target date fund. And you can see over here on the right what it looks like. Early on, you're 100% in small cap value. Then you go through a ramp from about 32 years old to age 65 that puts you into 20% small cap value and the rest in the target date fund. You do annual rebalancing during accumulation and nudge withdrawals in retirement. So it sounds like, you know, we're making it more complicated. Did it have any benefit? And the answer is yes. And in spades, historically, it had a huge benefit. The total benefit of the investing strategy is $10.3 million compared to the 4.4 million for the target date fund. But if you compare to the target date fund and say, well, what was the incremental value? You got an additional $5.9 million. So it's a huge, huge boost. And again, most of it this time comes in legacy, but you, you see that you've got uh, $3.6 million in retirement withdrawals, which is quite a bit more than either the 2.2 million for the tar target date fund or the 2.4 or 2.7 for the easy and moderate approaches. So there was a lot of gain, but there was also some cost. There was pain. Uh, the worst case drawdown for this strategy using these numbers, this is going back to 1970, was minus 56%. Almost, you know, you're getting close to 60%. And if we took it back farther, if we went back to the 1920s, it's hard to do with these assets, but um, it would be even lower. So before you embark on any of these strategies, you, you need to recognize that you're going to have to stick with it through some tough times to earn that added return. So here's a, a picture showing the, uh, the glide paths that we've just described with the details of what's going on with the target date fund asset classes in the top uh, and the small cap value in the bottom. And then down at the bottom of this, I've shown the pain curves. So you can see how the easy approach has this risk that is kind of higher towards retirement. Then we have the moderate approach where the risk gets ramped all the way down to uh, the same level as a target date fund. And then you have the aggressive approach, which has this worst case drawdown that is in the early years, but is quite a bit deeper and then ramps down and has a higher risk, higher drawdown risk in retirement because you're carrying that base of small cap value. The most interesting thing though, is that if you look at risk as measured by the safe withdrawal rate, the easy one, um, well, let's, let's start with the moderate one because the safe withdrawal rate of the moderate one is basically the same as a target date fund because you're 100% in the target date fund when you're in retirement. 
And the 30-year safe withdrawal rate going back to 1970 was 4.4% for the target date fund, and the 40-year safe withdrawal rate was 3.84%. The easy strategy is pretty close to the same, almost the same, just slightly better for the 40-year. But the aggressive strategy has the highest safe withdrawal rates at 4.7% for 30-year and 4.36% for the 40-year. Now, if I'm a retiree, that actually sounds a little bit safer. And the reason is, why, why would carrying some small cap value into retirement increase your safe withdrawal rate? Well, first of all, it has a higher expected growth rate than the very conservative allocation of the target date fund. But second, it's got some meaningful diversification because the small cap value goes up and down at slightly different times from the bonds and the uh, the whole total market funds that are in the target date fund. So thought food for thought for, for anybody considering these options, and there's way more detail, believe it or not, in my book if you want it. And just to kind of drive that point home in the appendix, for example, uh, we have this table that Daryl helped me create, which you can think of as a bit of a fine tuning table for the target date, these these two fund for life approaches and target date funds in general. This top left hand corner of all of these boxes is the target date fund because it's where there is no floor to the ramp in small cap value and where there is no year to retirement multiplier on small cap value. The easy to fund for life strategy is this box here to the right. The moderate is this box just under the target date fund and the aggressive is where we have this 20% floor and the two and a half times multiplier. That's this one down here. And what this table lets you look at is how the safe withdrawal rate, the uh, the median total retirement withdrawals in dollars, real dollars, the ending balance, and the drawdowns near near age forty, the maximum drawdown at age sixty five, and the maximum drawdown at age ninety five. How those all compare? So um, for people who want to explore, lots more data, and there's loads in the book. So one last kind of backtest experiment I wanted to do before we uh, do some summaries here is we've just been through all these very complicated ways to do investing, like the 10 fund, Worldwide Ultimate Buy and Hold. The 10 fund has these 10 equity, uh, equity classes that it combines together so that it's half in U.S., half in ex-US international, one half in equities, one half in fixed income, one half in large, one half in small, one half in value, one half in blend. And what I wanted to know is, could you do the same thing with two or three funds? And it turns out you can actually get very close with a mix of a 50% Vanguard 2055 target date fund, 20% in US small cap value, and 30% in international small cap value. And the reason you need to put more in international small cap value is that the target date fund tilts towards the US in its equity allocation. And if you look over here on the right at the back test, the portfolio one is the ultimate buy and hold. It had a CAGR of 7.39%. This portfolio created with just these three funds had a CAGR of 7.81%. The standard deviations, you know, which is a measure of volatility, were almost the same. The best year, worst year, worst drawdowns, very close to the same. And you can see that they even tracked each other quite well in terms of the returns over time. So I, I, what I want you to get out of this is that you don't need complexity. You can often get very similar kinds of returns with a smaller number of funds. And so if you choose to follow one of these simpler strategies, you don't have to feel like it's inferior. One other question I get is, you know, what if I'm too old to use (laughs) small cap value? I've heard Paul say, you know, sometimes you have to wait a decade or two and he doesn't feel like he has a decade or two. And we have shown 
charts like this one on the left. This is a telltale chart showing how small cap value performed relative to the S&P 500. And you can see that there's a period of time here where starting in 1928, small cap value underperformed the S&P 500 for 17 years. Um, and then you can see that it actually was close to equal to the S&P 500 performance, even all the way out to 35 years. Now, equal isn't necessarily bad. The S&P 500 over that period of time grew a lot. So it's not like you got a bad return. It's just that you didn't necessarily get ahead as much as you had hoped to. And by the way, these, these are after expense results um, using indexes and then loading them with expenses going back to 1928. There are other periods of time, though, where you get your return very fast. You know, in the 70s, you got your return almost no matter what year you, you entered, you got it quickly. And if you go to um, IFA.com, they have this really cool chart that you can generate that will compare the performance over rolling periods of time of large cap blend, which is close to the S&P 500, with small cap value. And what you see is that over one month holding periods, historically, it's a coin toss. Over 12 month periods, it's slightly better than a coin toss. There's a 55% chance over all of the 12 month periods that small cap value outperformed. At 36 months, it's about the same at five years. It's kind of 60-40, 60 percent chance you get that premium or at least a premium for small cap value. By the time you're out to 10 years, it's about 74 percent. Even at 15 years, though, there's a 15 percent chance that you won't get the premium. So what do I take out of all of this? If you have a short period of time and you're going to significantly regret or beat yourself up if you don't get the premium, then you should diversify. You should own some of multiple things um, and maybe not even own some small cap value. But even as conservative as Paul is, when he says he's not sure he's got a decade left, I believe he still invests in small cap value. So he's still hedging his bets even at the age he's at. So why wouldn't you do this? Why wouldn't you use two funds for life? Well, first one would be personal knowledge and preference. If you don't know enough to stay the course with something different, you shouldn't invest in something different. Or if you don't have the inclination to use a target date fund or small, small cap value, then you shouldn't use it. Or maybe you like the, the regret avoidance of having a 10 fund for solution. So you have to figure out what's best for you. Um, the second thing is tax efficiency. The target date fund is one fund. That one fund has international stocks in it. It's got bonds in it. Uh, if you can hold it in a tax advantaged account, the bond income is a non-issue, so that's good. You don't actually get the tax credits for the international tax that you're paying in there. So, uh, you know, you don't get to optimize every single thing in your account for tax efficiency. Um, for a lot of people though, that, that's gonna be a lesser issue. And related to that is control. Let's say you want a subtly different allocation of large cap value to small cap value to emerging markets. You just can't do that with so few funds. And then finally, regret avoidance. Um, you know, When you only own a couple of funds, there's gonna be a year when REITs are hot. And yeah, there's probably some REIT exposure in the target bait fund, but it's subtle. You're, you're going to feel bad that you didn't have a bigger allocation to the thing that was hot that year. So I think those are the big reasons not to do it. But I think for most people, um, they do very well to use either a target date fund or two funds for life. So in summary, uh, target date funds are the easiest way to buy right, hold tight and not peak. And it's a prudent choice. They automatically adjust your risk profile with age and they can double your expected lifetime spending power with only 10% savings. Two funds for life improves on target date funds by adding small cap value to increase expected total lifetime real returns by 25% to 130% or even more. 
They also increase, uh, the two fund for life strategies also increase retirement safe withdrawal rates significantly to greater than 4%, even at the 40 year time frame. And they improve meaningful diversification and portfolio resilience. So I think they're well worth consideration for all kinds of investors. And uh, with that, you know, you can go sign up for the free newsletter uh, and uh, get the free book. Uh, either we're talking millions, which has a great introduction to two funds for life or the two fund for life book, which I think of more as an owner's manual for two funds for life. Uh, or you can purchase them at Amazon and the profits go to the Merriman foundation. So with that, Paul and Daryl, what did I do wrong? One correction. <laughs> One. Okay. Yeah. They can get not only two funds for life free. They can also get we're talking millions free. And while Two Funds for Life is not available as an audio book, you can get two, uh, we're talking millions, free as an audio file. So, so there, you can get three things for free. And what we hope people do is share them with friends and family and what not. But I do have a desire to make this as super easy to understand as possible. Uh, I, I think there'll be a lot of people who there are enough numbers there that they're going to have to watch this again to, to, to really get their arms around it and understand it or read the book. But let me take it down to something that the three of us have been working hard on for the last weeks in building this whole series of, uh, of, of portfolios and, and ways to take distributions fixed or flexible. And here's my bottom line question. We, we showed people how to use these different portfolios over a lifetime. Daryl was kind enough to do a particular set of uh, tables where a person could see what they could grow their money to uh, over anywhere from 40 to 50 plus years. Uh, if they it started young, uh, and 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 we started with a thousand dollars, but let's face it, somebody who is a, is really serious about this is probably going to start with more than a thousand dollars a year uh, in whatever investments in their four hundred one k they have. So, just humor me here with your intuition. If a person has started a job, and of course, if they don't go to college, they get to start right away. Uh, so, so they could actually start saving money maybe earlier than a college graduate. But let's just assume it's somebody coming out of college, and they're going to put away ten percent. Now, now maybe that's going to be too much, but we know lots of people who are able to do that. And they put it into a target date fund for the next 40 or 45 years. When we did those investigations of how much money it takes to retire, uh, and of course, that's going to be special for each person. But generally speaking, should a person who has put away 10% of their wage, including bonuses, and then you might even get a match on top of that, should they have enough to fund retirement with what we called enough that they could meet their needs uh, with that, that body, that bunch of money they've got invested now? Is it fair to say they should be able to retire at 60, 65, or 70 and take out that 4% adjusted for inflation and meet their lifetime needs, probably. It, m most financial ad, uh, advice that you find out there has kind of settled on this 10 to 15% savings rate is, is a good choice across a normal career and lifetime, you know, to enable a secure retirement. I, it, my short answer would be yes to your question because what the research shows is that you worked for 40 years and you earned 
X, whatever X is. I'm not even going to assume that you earned a certain amount of money. If you save 10% and you put it in a target date fund, the median result in real inflation adjusted dollars is that you get to spend that same amount again or pass it on to heirs across a 30 year retirement. So you got fewer years to spend it and you got the same amount of money. So I think now, would I encourage my kids to save more than 10%? Absolutely. Because you don't know that you're going to be able to work 40 years. You may find out that you know you, you get disabled, God forbid, right? Or that you, you for whatever reason, you, you're out of work for a decade, right? I mean, stuff happens. So it's good to to be cautious and to be prudent. But my short answer would be yes. I think somebody who saves 10% into a target date fund across a lifetime, especially when you add in social security or, you know, some kind of a social safety net, hopefully still there in that time frame. Um, I think, I think they'd be able to do just fine. Daryl, would you agree with that from all the table making that you've done? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I would. All right. So with that, I'm just going to assume that if we could encourage people just to use the target date fund, that's a good outcome for people who want to to retire and have enough, not more than enough, because now I want to talk about more than enough. And we just did together a, 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 a video about uh, having more than enough. And when you have more than enough, all of a sudden, you have the ability to take out more money. And I think we decided that in order to have that more than enough that should protect you from being more aggressive in terms of taking out distributions, that we wanted to have 50% more. Agreed? At a minimum. So right. if, if it could have been a million dollars for for the enough strategy, the the 4% and adjust for inflation, that's what we wanted to make sure they could do. Then if they had 1.5 million, they could maybe take 5% instead of four, and, and, and they end up taking a lot more money over, uh, over their lifetime in using the flexible strategy. But what that says to me is that if we could get people, young people, 35 and less, I'm going to say, or 40 and less, if we could get them to do the strategy with the target date fund and in for 8% or 80% of whatever is being put away, and we could have the other 20% in small cap value, we are, um, not we are, they are giving themselves a chance to get from the retirement where they have enough and they can take out 4% and they have to be careful to having more than enough where they could take out 5%. So instead of taking out 40 grand a year, they're taking out uh, $75,000 uh, a year and enjoying a different lifestyle. And your work, Chris, suggests that the, the risk to put that 20% into small cap value is is not all that great. And I have to add one more thing. When we looked at putting away a portfolio that's half S&P 500 and half small cap value, and we looked at all of the losing years, the losing years were no more with that 50-50 than they were for the S&P 500. So that's even more aggressive. So that, what, I mean, if I would talk to a young person and we had to talk about, well, can I get you to put 10%, you know, put in 9% into the target date fund and 10%, I'd be saying, look, go for the 8% into the target date fund, 20 into the small cap value, give it 10 years, give it 15 years, find out how it's doing. I find out how you're feeling about the risk that you've taken. We can see on this kind of fine tuning table 
the scenario you just talked about. So this is the right here is the dollar amount that you would get in or would have gotten the median total retirement real dollars was 2.7 million. This is assuming a 20% fixed non-rebalance uh, approach like you just described. The ending balance was 4.7. So you add those two and you get 7.4. And that is 70% more. So now you got 1.7 instead of, but there's some bad news, right? You got to always look at both sides of this. And the worst of the bad news is up here. The maximum drawdown actually occurs when you're approaching retirement. And it was 47%. Now, somebody who's had good experience with small cap value, across 40 years of accumulation and has watched it grow to the point that it caused that kind of a loss, maybe they could stay the course, right? Maybe yeah. they'd be okay with it. But because you're not rebalancing, because you're, uh, you're letting it ride, letting your winners run, so to speak, um, there is a downside to that strategy. Uh, and, and I just wanted to make sure people know what it is. And and so maybe it's a matter, uh, and we have years to try to continue to investigate this. I hope we have years. It is a matter of doing that in the early years so that if you're at a certain point by the time you're 40 or 45 or 50, that what you do is you move to action to capture that advantage that you've had and, and, and set a, a portfolio uh, down that is going to be less risky because you now have enough to be which, ahead. Which is kind of what the aggressive strategy does, right? Because it starts you out heavy yeah. in, in small cap value, and then it ramps it down uh, as you're approaching retirement, but still keeps you a base in there of diversification. Yeah. And and of course, as we've shown in the tables that that – are supposed to be following the math. Uh, ten, you you can go beyond the ten percent. You can you can raise the amount of money you put in every year a little bit and do things that continue to give you a better and better chance to retire with more than enough. And and, and what we're talking about is simply trying to get you to a point where you are protected on the downside because you have in essence, over saved. Daryl, did you have a, a a question that popped up? I, ha I have a, a comment and an observation. Um, the comment is that Chris cited the uh, use of the uh, sustainable or safe withdrawal rate. And that's not necessary. It's not in the context of that's what you should do. You should withdraw that amount, of, at least the way I look at it, is that that's not a withdrawal strategy necessarily. But what it is, is you look and compare safe withdrawal rates one to another, one scenario to another. It's a measure, in my way of thinking, of res resilience to the of the portfolio to sequence of return risk. So if a portfolio has a higher safe withdrawal rate based on the standard approach for calculating that, it's more, it's more resilient to the vagaries and the drawdowns in the market than if you have a lower safe withdrawal rate. Uh, that's that's the, the, the comment, I guess. The observation is that over the last many podcasts, we've, we've talked a lot about the different kinds of asset allocation and diversification and risk and reward with all the different sound investing portfolios. And that, to my way of thinking, is primarily in the context of teaching points or learning points about how these things, different things interact and how you can mix and match and create a, a viable portfolio. But what Chris has done here is actually taken a lot of that or maybe all of that uh, data and those points and integrated it into a simple, easy, realistically implementable approach to, to taking no, all those lessons learned and doing it in something that is simple and easy to do for an individual who may not be interested in all the nuts and bolts and, and how the sausage gets made. That's, I think that's great. And, and something else that came up just yesterday, I was speaking to a young uh, CFP, Cody Garrett, 
who has uh, an investment advisory firm, Measure Twice, Measure Twice Financial dot com, um, and he he made the note that at American funds and dimensional funds, the 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 equity U.S. international U.S. to, to international is seventy thirty. At Schwab and T. Rowe Price, it's 6535. At Vanguard and State Street, it's 6040. At Fidelity, it's 5050. So this is another aspect uh, of this. Uh, and I'm and I'm curious, in your case, Chris, if you had a choice, forget who's managing the portfolio. But would you rather have 70-30s, 60-40, uh, This is the U.S. international split, right? I, yep. I, yep. I like the way Vanguard does it with the 60-40 because it's, uh, it's tilted to the U.S., which is aligned with investors' comfort. They're largely serving an American market. But it's not tilted so far that you lose the meaningful exposure to uh, what I think of as inexpensive insurance against catastrophic failure in any one country. I, I like that. I like the Vanguard Glide Path. I think that it's prudent and uh, it's a good one. And it's close to our target in terms of where we're, our comfort zone is too. Yeah. Daryl, any comment yourself, uh, bias-wise? Uh my biases are consistent with Chris's. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful strategy and, and we're talking about a lifetime discipline. So it seems to me, I don't know if you've timed how long it takes to read the book, Chris, but a few hours, two hours. Okay. And we're talking millions is is two to three hours. Uh, I think actually, you uh, my my book is. It takes me a few hours to read it. It'll take somebody unfamiliar with the material probably five five or there six. There we go. I would say, right. Because there's a lot in there, and it really is an owner's manual for the strategy. It's it's designed. I I wrote it to do two things: to convince myself that it's prudent and and well founded, and then to answer as many of the questions somebody living with it for a lifetime might have to go through. And so some people reading it just won't care about the question of, well, what happens if it goes sideways in retirement or what if I'm a late starter or, you know, there's, but the reference is there so that when that question comes up along your journey, you can go and read it. Yeah. Daryl. Yeah. Well, and, and the way you've written the book, you can read it a couple of different ways, right? You you there's there you can read the introductory sections and get the gist of most of what the of what's the point of a given chapter and then move on to the next chapter if you want yep. the nitty gritty you can go deeper so you can read it in a in a summary way quickly to see if it's something that might make sense for you if it and if it is then you can go back and dig into the parts uh, later on in the chapters. Well, our job is to try to change financial futures, and Chris, I think. Uh, you've done a great job of of giving people information to do that. Thank you very much, Daryl. As always, thank you. Your tables are are great lessons for all of us, and uh, and 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 for me, I'm just hoping we can figure out a way with the help of all of our of our friends and family with the foundation uh, to get these two books in the hands of as many young people as we can. And again, we make those available free as a PDF in the hopes that you will spread that amongst family and friends uh, to get this information to more folks. Thanks guys. And thank you, you, you loyal viewers out there. We appreciate uh, your patience with us. We got more coming in this series. I mean, this series is the most serious series we've ever done. We got a couple more that we're going to do, and then uh, uh, we'll we'll hope that that will give people the kind of really deep understanding of uh, of investing that they need. So, good luck to all of you, and thanks. We'll see you soon.